Good evening. Today's topic is global market entry strategies. In other words, I can say foreign market entry strategies. Some of you might have heard about uh, different market entry strategies in some of the courses, but today we are going to synthesize foreign market entry strategies. And we will also look at uh, different markets and what criteria to be decided, what entry modes or strategies to be decided when a company want to enter into foreign markets. It's ranging from these entry strategies, ranging from uh, exporting to creating your own companies, foreign subsidiary uh, in a foreign market. So we have to analyze other entry modes like uh, collaborative entry modes like franchising and licensing too. And we have a video on Subway and we have a case uh, presentation and discussion uh, too. So today, let me start with the PowerPoint and uh, then I can have a video and then uh, we have a presentation. Probably after the break, we have presentation and discussion of the case. All right. Market entry strategies. Can be classified as exporting licensing and franchising strategic alliance equity joint venture turnkey project foreign subsidiary or foreign branch. Outsourcing is also another market entry strategy. We're going to look at this one by one in detail so that you will have more clarity and you will be in a position to decide what is the best possible market entry strategy for your company. And depending upon your company's uh, business plan, it also depending upon the regulatory requirements in foreign market, it also depending upon your company's vision and mission. So your company has to decide uh, which market entry strategy is need to be uh, used and need to be implemented. Let me start with exporting. Exporting can be classified as indirect exports and direct exports. And why do we classify exporting as indirect export and direct export? Uh, we can discuss this, but uh, for example, uh, you know, some of the companies are manufacturing the product and exporting the same product. In that case, they can be called as manufacturer exporters. That means they do make their product and they export their, their product. On the other hand, some companies, they do not manufacture the product, but they buy product from manufacturers and they export it. So there are different types of uh, exporters or exporters can be broadly classified as direct exporters and indirect exporters. In case, uh, if you can tell us some examples based on your information or based on your knowledge, some company example. This is a company I know that this company is involved in direct export. This company is involved in indirect exports. Can you tell me some example? Hmm. You mean an, an example, a specific real life example of indirect yeah. exportation yeah. or direct yeah. exportation? I don't, like, you know I don't know of a specific company that does it because I don't know exportation companies, but I would assume that perhaps like a lot of the coffee companies that produce coffee here use an exportation company to indirectly ex export their coffee off the, the island. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they, you have to look at whether they are exporting it uh, directly or indirectly. 
I mean, uh, in case, uh, you know, some of them are, some of them have the capability to do it directly. Some of them don't have the capability to do it uh, directly. Anyway, let me explain this uh, process uh, once more, one more time. Indirect export uh, includes international sales through merchant exporters and export houses. Manufacturers do not export directly in this case. Yeah, manufacturers are not exporting in this case directly, but uh, there are intermediaries, intermediaries like merchant exporters, exporters specializing only in sales, they do not manufacture. So exporters specialized only in sales and they do not manufacture. Such exporters are called or can be called as merchant exporters. Professor, there's someone in the waiting room. Yeah, so. Okay. Okay, so and another example for indirect export is uh, sales to consortium like government agencies and so on. So, yeah, all, all these type of exports can be called as indirect export. The first one I explained is sale through merchant exporters. So merchant exporters do involve in indirect export because they do not uh, manufacture the item. They buy from manufacturers and export it. So that can be called as a indirect export. And sale through consortium or government agencies also can be also called as uh, indirect export. For example, uh, in Japan, there is an automobile federation this is an association of uh, different automobile companies, or automotive companies. And for example, small or medium scale enterprises in the automobile sector, they want to export. They don't have the capability and experience and they don't have the enough manpower to do the transactions. So what they do is that they, they seek guidance and they, they actually hire this Japan Automobile Federation. Japan Automobile Federation will buy from them and they, and, and, and this uh, consortium called Japan Automobile Federation, they will export it. Suppose if your company is small or medium scale and you don't have the uh, knowledge, information, capacity and capital to leverage the opportunities in the foreign markets. So you can do this with the help of this kind of consortiums or government agencies and they will do it on your behalf. So that, that is an example for indirect export. Yeah, for another example, I can tell you, there is an organization called Brands, Brands of Puerto Rico, Brands from Puerto Rico, something like that, okay. So, in case if there is a small Puerto Rican company which has trouble in finding foreign market for international sales, so if it's a product manufacturer made in Puerto Rico, this, this organization, I am told, they specialize and exporting Puerto Rican made items in foreign countries. So they, they, they will act as a merchant exporter, they will act as a intermediary and, and they do it. So, uh, yeah, so there are different type of uh, indirect exporting prevail in different uh, countries. Direct export, direct export, uh, uh, some examples for direct export sales to direct sales to distributors so direct sale to retailers direct sale to overseas agents direct sales to end consumers direct sales by the producer direct sales by the manufacturer to distributor or retailer or overseas agents otherwise end consumers this can be called as direct exports so it needs to be direct. There should not be any intermediary in this case. So, but it, it need not be direct sale to the consumers, but it can be direct sale to the distributors or retailers or dealers in, in foreign markets. So advantages of direct uh, exports. I have I explained here, somebody can, exp can, somebody can uh, discuss some of these points. So what are the advantages of uh, direct exports? 
Yeah, you can simply read this and discuss. Liana, we cannot hear you. I think you are, uh, uh, microphone is mute. I, I was just reading the, the slide. Yeah. Thinking. What does it mean by more risk and more return and more control and more expertise? Well, you know, if, if it's indirect, right, you usually have a third party that's assisting you. And of course, uh, there's there you might, you know, in most cases, there would be less risk because usually that third party has the knowledge of the home base where you're going to be sending your products, uh, you know, laws, everything, licensing. But of course, they're going to keep a cut of that. I'm um, sorry, Jose. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm the only one, but I can't hear you well. We have trouble to hear you. So. Yeah, do you hear me well now? I'm not sure why. Yeah. It sounds like your microphone's covered a little bit. Yeah. Open your mic closer to your mouth. See, give me one second. Yeah. Are you going? Here. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Good. Yes. Better. A little better, yeah. Okay, I'll I'll talk slow because the internet is a bit spotty. But um, basically, when you're you know if you're doing indirect exportation, you usually have a third party who is uh, assisting. But of course, that helps you have less risk in the way that that third party is usually supporting you with uh, you know governmental regulations, uh, maybe even with the language, uh, lots of different stuff, but they're going to keep a cut, you know, they're, they're going to charge you for their expertise, um, they're going to charge you probably royalties or maybe even a subscription fee, so you do have, you will have less total returns, but of course if you're, if for some companies it might not be possible to do direct exports, um, without a high risk of failure or, or just a lot of uncertainty. So of course with direct exportation you do if you do have the right people and the right, you know, you do the right thing at the right time with your exports, then there's a lot more uh, returns available to that company. Yeah. That's right. And uh, of course, you need to have knowledge. Your company, your people need to be knowledgeable, competent regarding documentation, regarding pricing, regarding export finance and import finance, and, and uh, marketing expertise too. So you need to be, you need, you need to have experts uh, in, in your company to do the direct exports. If you don't have that kind of expertise and capability, if you venture into direct exports, sometimes you will not succeed. So, but you need to, you, you can succeed provided you have right people, you have uh, competent people in your company, those who can serve as export managers. So let me move on to other entry strategies. Licensing and franchising, strategic alliances, joint venture, turnkey projects, subsidiary and branches. Licensing and franchising. Yeah. Licensing and franchising are like uh, twins, you know, twins. Two people are born together, they are twins. So licensing and franchising, theory is same. But in practice, they are different. But the theory is same. The theory of franchising and licensing is the same because both they are considered or they are legally long-term non-equity partnership between one company and another company in a market. It is a non-equity partnership because two companies, they are not registering a new company with the financial stake from those companies. They are not registering a new company. 
what they are doing is they have a memorandum of understanding. They have memorandum of understanding and uh, uh, based on this memorandum of understanding, they operate, but uh, parent company doesn't share the cost. The parent company is only transferring know-how. Parent company will transfer knowledge. Parent company will teach the local business partner how to do things. But local partner will invest money. So in both licensing and franchising, the local business partner will have to invest money. Franchises operate or licenses operate with investment from local partner. So the original company, the real owner, does in invest money in both. Real owner has established brand equity and real owner is actually trying to capitalize the capability or brand equity that uh, they have created. So, licensing is a means of establishing a foothold in foreign markets without large capital outlays. Licensing include patent rights, trademarks, and the right to use technological know-how for protection in a foreign country. Licensing is normally is a term used mainly for manufacturing or assembling or production activities. When you hire a local partner in a foreign country for some kind of production, it can be, it can be contract manufacturing. So such kind of uh, production activities, you can simply call it as licensing. Some examples for licensing is Nike American company is doing contract manufacturing in countries like Vietnam and China. They make, uh, they, they have local partner in China and Vietnam. And those that local partner, Chinese company or Vietnamese company, will make Nike shoe. And Nike America will teach them how to do it. But American company Nike will not transfer money from America to China to make Nike in China. So they will teach Chinese partner, will do it, and then they will share the royalty, they will share the profits. Profit will be shared between two companies as per the royalty term. So that is how the licensing works. So parent company, what does a parent company, licensing and franchising works in the same theory. The same theory is applicable in licensing and franchising. Parent company doesn't invest money, but local partner invest money. Parent company will teach them how to do things. Excuse me, Professor, someone had to leave and they're trying to come back in because of the, the internet connection. Okay. It was really was fatty. Okay. So, yeah, licensing, even, even uh, some items like pen can be licensed. I know a French company, Reynolds, they, do have uh, hired or they have a local business partner to make their pen in South Asian countries, French, uh, French brand, French pen brand, uh, Reynolds pen, pen, you know, the writing pen. So, so uh, different items, like it can be shoe or it can be a pen, it can be any items that you have a local partner to make your item in, in, in a foreign market, that is, uh, that can be called as licensing. And, and you are actually not spending your money. You are a famous brand, that is the reason. When you advertise for a local licensee or local franchisee, they come forward and they do operate. But in some cases, even in, 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 in uh, you know, I mean, you can also use the word licensing in some cases, in some services sector, so you can either use the word franchisee or licensing, 
uh, sometimes uh, like Microsoft franchises are known as Microsoft licenses. It, it can be interchangeably also used. Franchising and licensing uh, can be interchangeably used because theory is same, only in practice it is different. Uh, that is why some places you will see Microsoft uh, franchises. You know, Microsoft has franchises in uh, many countries for conducting MS Office training program and teach uh, people Microsoft software. So, uh, and they, they are called as franchises or licensing, but it is the same thing. So, uh, basic difference normally what is the main difference between franchising and licensing is franchising is a terminology mostly people use in services sector and licensing is a terminology mostly people use uh, for a production activity or a manufacturing activity but some people use both interchangeably the main reason is theory is same for both or in principle, both have same roots, both have, both have same operational mechanism. What is that operational mechanism? I already told and explained, I would like to hear from you. What is the theory, same theory in, in franchising and licensing? Both are, both li licensing and franchising are strategies that involve a local partner in the foreign foreign market that the company or the franchisor is trying to enter so in theory they work the same because they the parent company for the see the franchisor or the licensor has to provide like a certain set of tools if i understood this correctly they provide a certain set of tools to that franchisee or licensee in order for them to provide their own capital um, and their own knowledge or local knowledge of the market and therefore be able to distribute the the product or service more effectively in that foreign market hmm. somebody else can explain this or can answer this in a different way Um, I would say it's um, when a company has a partner and this company authorizes this partner to manufacture or provide the services um, using the tools and resources that um, the parent company provides. And um, the way that they make income is through royalties. So in theory, the, it's the same. It's just that one of them is for service and one for them is for, the other one is for production. Licensing is for production of products and the other one is for services. Yes, so the basic, yeah. So the basic notion in, in both is the parent company, the original company, doesn't invest their money. Doesn't invest their money. Yeah. So, all investment come from local partner. So it's, it's a nice way of expanding into a foreign market for the parent company. Suppose if I have my own business, if I want to expand into foreign markets, in case if I call for franchisee or licensing and then I get uh, local partners to come forward to invest uh, their money to do business with me as my local partner in their country, I would love that because I don't have to invest my money. So I can expand with somebody else's money. That's the beauty of franchising or licensing. And we will have a term, we will have a condition that, uh, you know, some companies have conditioned that depending upon the brand equity that 25% profit will be shared with the parent company. 75% profit goes to the local partner. Some companies will have 20% goes to parent company and 80% goes to uh, local partner, depending upon uh, the decision depending upon the terms and condition of the depending upon the business policy or business strategy of uh, parent company this ratio of royalty will be decided between local partner and uh, parent company so but I will get if I have from running a business and I will get a local partner to invest uh, uh, in my franchisee or you know to, to open my franchisee in a foreign market only if I enjoy 
significant brand equity. You know, because local partner will come forward to do business only in case if you think that my brand is very well known in his market. Otherwise, he can set up his own brand, his, his own business, right? Sometimes, uh, like for example, Starbucks or McDonald's or any of those companies, you look at, uh, uh, you know, Starbucks or McDonald's in San Juan. Uh, otherwise, you look at uh, any other, those kind of uh, franchises in San Juan. It can be Subway franchises. Subway has franchises in San Juan. So people, local people are coming forward to invest in those franchises, thinking that it will be better for them if they do the franchise business as a well-known brand instead of setting up my own business or instead of setting up a local new business. Because sometimes people think that if I set up my own restaurant, I'm not confident that how many people will show up as customers. So I might think about setting up a franchisee of Subway or McDonald's or Starbucks or whatever possible. So, uh, but some people are confident, some entrepreneurs are confident to set up my own business and they do their own business. So we have all the, all the type of businessmen or business people in this world in different countries and uh, some people don't want to take the risk but they have capital to invest so they are ready to open up a franchisee of a well-known brand. So professor, I have a, I have a question. Yeah. So you mentioned that the parent company doesn't invest any money. Um, however, how is negotiated the like training and transfer of knowledge? Cause then the parent company will have to do some investment. Is it recovered through the agreements? Uh, I mean, yes, there has to be agreement to, to sign and, uh, uh, this agreement need to be perfectly done and this can be also executed uh, in such a way that these are acceptable to both because so that, that is the reason both are signing the agreement and uh, the, you know so, so sometimes uh, the, the franchises or licensees will be given for initial three years so many of them are for three years sometimes it can be four years or five year contract also so, and it can be renewable so at the end of the contract, it can be renewable. So that also will be mentioned in the contract and, and uh, definitely there will be also profit sharing condition depending upon the parent company's policy because parent company will let uh, a local business partner to run their franchisee only in case if local partners agreeing to certain terms and conditions as per the business strategy of, uh, as per the marketing strategy of uh, parent company because if they have well-known brand they will sometimes dictate the terms and conditions if their brand is not very well known they might be happy to give more profit to the local partner if the brand is very well known so they they may not be very keen to give a substantial percentage of profit to the local partner so it all depending upon the parent company's uh, reputation brand equity and their uh, business strategy so what uh, profit should be shared to be decided between those companies and uh, sometimes uh, you know of course they will also check the background of the local business partner when they call for franchisee so suppose if they call for franchise in san juan let's say starbucks is calling for franchise in san juan they could they might get 50 applications from local businessmen so then starbucks will screen and starbucks will look at to whom to be given so it's like a job advertisement when somebody is advertising for jobs, sometimes uh, there will be many candidates and then company has to decide, company has to decide based on some criteria. So the same theory is applicable here on, and, and uh, parent company will have to work with the local partner to teach them how to do things. And uh, normally franchising is not risky because franchising is normally in service sector where not much technology transfer is involved. But licensing can be risky when in, in high technology intensive industries. So in high technology intensive industries, sometimes companies do not do licensing. For example, car making is a high technology industry. Yeah. Car manufacturing is a high technology industry. So car manufacturing companies do not offer licensing because 
they are afraid of the business partner stealing their technology. So licensing normally work in industries which are not very technology intensive. So it works mainly in labor intensive industries where technology is not very important. So, so because so that there is no threat of uh, uh, stealing the techno technical know-how. For example, pharmaceutical industry, licensing doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, so in franchises, franchises can be given for sales. It can be given for services or servicing. So uh, like uh, some of the laptop companies or some of the cellular companies, they have given franchises for servicing, servicing the phone or servicing the laptop. So, you know, so after sales service, franchises are hired and franchises offer such services. So those kind of uh, uh, services are also offered through franchises and franchises, Microsoft franchises for training people. They are all classic examples of different types of franchising. And we all know that Subway is franchised in San Juan, McDonald's is franchised in San Juan, and uh, even Starbucks is franchised in San Juan. So, but sometimes some companies, what they do is that like McDonald's, when they entered into German market, what was McDonald's original policy was that McDonald's decided to invest their money. First entry into German market was with their money. They invested money for 30 stores in Germany. First 30 stores of McDonald's, first 30 restaurants of McDonald's uh, in Germany originally opened were with investment from McDonald's and that they were not franchises. Then what they did was that they, they built a brand in, in Germany and they even, I mean, American brands were also known to the Germans. And when they were relatively well known in German market, they wanted to expand and they called for franchises and they uh, you know, uh, uh, decided to set up uh, many franchises. And if you look at the current operations of McDonald's in Germany, they have, you know, their own, their own stores and they have franchises also. So what is, so uh, McDonald's Germany exists, coexists with their own stores and franchise stores too. So this coexistence business model is there in many other industries. For example, if you actually look at uh, any foreign company, which has a franchise, which has 10 or 15 or 20 stores in San Juan, you might find that uh, maybe uh, one or two are directly operated by them, one or two may be directly owned by them without a franchisee local partner. But uh, they will have, let's say if they have 10 outlets, maybe two or three will be directly owned or operated by them with their investment, but maybe six or seven will be franchises. So these are all uh, different permutations and combinations through which uh, companies expand. It need only it need not be in this sector, but also in any other sector also. In restaurant industry also, this is also applicable in local markets also. So local market, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, some of the restaurants or some of the cafes, they have, they, they open up many, many, many uh, outlets. They, they use franchisee, you know. So they use franchisee more to, to open up it's not only in cafe and restaurant, in many other sectors also, you can do this. For example, let's say you are running a yoga teaching, uh, let's say you run a yoga teaching business or you run a dance teaching business or you run any kind of business, you run a music teaching business or you run a gym, 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 gym. Yesterday I wanted to go to gym, so, but uh, I didn't go. So gym, um, you know, let's say you have a gym or you, you, you are a business owner of a gym and you want to expand. And I know, let's say, I think Gold Gym is there in Puerto Rico, some other gym is also there. So there are a couple of gyms here. So, 
you might invest only in one 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 of one of one gym but then you built a brand for your gym and you want to expand then you can call for franchisee in case if, if someone else is coming forward to uh, invest money as your franchisee and, and then you decide the terms and conditions and then, then they will invest their money and you will teach them how to do. And, and, and uh, it can be a renewable contract for three years or four years or five years and, and then look at the possibilities for renewal later and, and you, you share the profit based on predetermined uh, profit sharing, royalty sharing mechanism. Many companies operate that way. Ruben Cafe. Ruben Cafe is a, a you know cafe established by uh, someone who moved to Puerto Rico from Dominican Republic. I don't know whether you know Ruben Cafe. So uh, I read their story. They originally, when he moved to San Juan, into San Dulce, I think he originally moved to San Dulce from Dominican Republic. At that time, uh, he opened only one restaurant and he recognized business opportunity. And he expanded not only in San Juan, but also in, in Florida, in, in some other states in the US. Now he has franchises in, 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 in the US. In, in Florida, he has a good number of franchises. So Ruben Cafe. And I also seen recently that they have opened a new uh, restaurant Ruben Cafe in Condado. So there are two Ruben Cafe in Condado. There is one in Santur, so there are three within walking distance of my, my apartment. So, uh, and some of them are franchises. Yeah, so you want to talk about any examples of franchise or licensing that you know? Share with uh, everyone. Professor, uh, here in Denver, um, I would share the Patio Pizza franchise because I know the owner and I've been to uh, various um, restaurants and I can see differences in each one because of the owners. So maybe that's a good example in here for Rico, the Patio Pizza uh, franchise. Mm -hmm. Uh, professor, uh, in my case, um, Planet Fitness um, uh, is one of the largest gym chains in the United States. Um, they have a franchise uh, that that is um, owned by um, the the Chagas, right? And that franchise includes Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and Canada, um, but it operates basically. Um, true franchises in the United States and in other parts of um, the world. So uh, I can relate the, that example to, to the franchise uh, stuff that you said. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to strategic alliance. Strategic alliance is another form of Market and strategy. Actually, what is that? It's coming from my computer or your computer? Okay. So, strategic alliances. Strategic alliances are simple memorandum of understanding, MOUs. A strategic alliance is a business relationship established by two or more companies to cooperate out of mutual need and to share risk in achieving a common objective. So here, Yeah, so here, this is, this is purely based on a memorandum of understanding. This can be for a year. This can be for six months. It can be for two years. So here, 
there is no cash transaction involved in a strategic alliance directly at the time of signing the contract or anything like that. And it can be, a, it can purely based on memorandum of understanding. It need not be a legal contract. Franchising and licensing, there has to be a legal contract. But uh, in a strategic alliance, uh, it can be purely based on business relationship established by two or more companies to cooperate out of mutual need and share risk in achieving a common objective. So here, for example, airlines have strategic alliances. Like sometimes you want to fly to Europe, JetBlue will take you from San Juan to Miami or San Juan to Fort Lauderdale. And then from Fort Lauderdale to Miami, you might get Norwegian airline to fly to Europe. So the JetBlue and Norwegian airlines will have a strategic alliance. So that is why when you buy a ticket, in one purchase, you can get the tickets of both airlines. So, including transfer. So that is because of the strategic alliance between two airlines. And likewise, you can have strategic alliances in different sector. The strategic alliances are rising out of mutual need. Sometimes, you know, it's a simple, simple example of, uh, Selling, like you know, selling through a supermarket can also be considered as an example for strategic alliance. For example, you make a chocolate in, in your town, or you make uh, anything else, coffee or something else, bread, anything like that, and then you want to sell in a foreign country, you simply look for some supermarkets to get a strategic alliance with a memorandum of understanding to sell your product for next six months or next one year. And, and if they do that, that is, that, is, that is simply a strategic alliance with them because they agree uh, to sell your product uh, for next one year or for next two years. And they will sell other products also, but it is a memorandum of understanding. It is an example for strategic alliances. There are, these are simple forms of strategic alliances. Or even, uh, you know, sometimes you can also have these days strategic alliances with uh, mobile app providers, mobile app providers, or even simply listing your product on Amazon uh, to sell on a regular basis is also an alliance with uh, Amazon. Strategic alliances are sought as a way to shore up weaknesses and increase competitive strength. For instance, airline industry has a strategic alliance, uh, like the Star Alliance is an example for strategic alliance of different airlines. Sky Team is another strategic alliance of different airlines. These are multilateral alliances. And One World is another example in the airline industry. Examples include alliance between a foreign producer and local distributor. Yeah. Mm. Professor, yeah. um, I have a question. So recently, two uh, big pharma companies announced that they were collaborating um, to produce an antibody for COVID-19. Would you call that a strategic alliance? That is a joint venture, classic, I mean, equity joint venture. If they, if they are setting up a new registered company with financial stake from both companies, in that case, it has to be called as equity joint venture. If they are setting up a new company, with financial stake from both companies. So they are, they broadly, they fall in the strategic alliance because strategic alliance is a very broad term, very broad terminology. So it can, it can be called as strategic alliance, but technically or legally, it is an equity joint venture. That is what I'm going to talk about. My next point is equity joint venture. If, if they have decided or if they have entered into a registration of a new company with financial stake. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that, this is my next point. Equity joint ventures. It's here. Equity joint venture. Yeah. So, equity joint ventures have been increasingly used since 1970s. And uh, a joint venture or equity joint venture, I mentioned JV. JV is equal to, equity is silent here, but it is the same thing. JV is equal to strategic alliance plus equity stake 
plus a legal new entity with long term goal like and it is talking about uh two pharmaceutical companies coming together to make a new product in that case so that 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 is uh, will be similar to this it is a joint venture but it is also strategic alliance so it can be it can be like this joint venture uh, joint venture between those two companies and it's, it's a strategic alliance but both companies have financial equity stake in that and they are setting up new legal entity with the long term goal the goal is not really one or two years short term they have a long term goal that is why they are registering a new legal entity right this is what your question right any this is your question right i'm answering your question yeah i mean i don't i don't know the terms of you know the equity stake or the legal entity i know there were a lot of um you know like kind of like restrictions um sharing information from from one partner to the other and the you know the owner of the molecule is Eli Lilly and then they partner with Amgen for the manufacturing the same as there's another one that is partnering with Pfizer just to manufacture okay hmm. so yeah it must it must be an equity joint venture in case you both uh, take financial stake initially initial investment come from both companies then it will be an equity joint venture it will be called as equity joint venture so the basic difference between strategic alliance and joint venture strategic alliance and joint venture are also uh like two sides of the same coin like franchising and licensing are the two sides of the same coin so same way strategic alliance and joint venture are also two sides of the same coin strategic alliance is a broad set joint venture is a subset of strategic alliance so in other words you can say let's say if you look at puerto rico let's say uh you know in one month time in puerto rico this is a hypothetical example 50 people are getting married in 30 days time and there could be 500 boyfriend and girlfriend okay so uh the married couple or the married people are like joint ventures because they have they are registering new legal entity with long term goal but it's a subset of 500 boyfriends and girlfriends 50 out of 500 so the same theory here so there are many strategic alliances but they are, they are not registering they are all not registering a new legal entity with financial uh stake from both so they are all such a simple alliances they are all simple alliances so so in real life this this in business can be compared with the real life situation in the other do you, do you understand what i'm explaining hmm so you answer now so joint venture is like uh, uh, you know husband and wife or uh, strategic alliance is like husband and wife what is your answer um they they both can fit under the same it will all depend on the conditions of that relationship legal and economic yeah i mean a relationship in real life become legal when someone gets married otherwise it's not legal so the, the same theory here i mean legal in sense uh, both will have a stake financial stake so here also something like uh, you know the equity stake or both are legally becoming eligible for financial stake when they are setting up a a uh, new legal entity you know so otherwise otherwise it's just like a, an alliance and and uh, for example uh, breaking up in the case of an equity joint venture is not that easy once you have an equity joint venture between two companies breaking up is not that easy but breaking up a strategic alliance it's very easy the same theory suppose you know if, it, if there is a boy and girl if they are just boyfriend and girlfriend they can easily break up but but in case if somebody is married there are formalities to be followed it may take a six months time it may take one year time it may take two year time depending upon the complication so 
uh, these are all the issues like General Motors. General Motors is an American car company. General Motors went to China and set up a joint venture in China uh, with the Shanghai Automotive and Industry Corporation, SAIC. And at some point of time, after two, three years, SAIC wanted a divorce from General Motors. SAIC wanted to be independent from General Motors. And General Motors uh, felt like uh, SAIC had already stolen their technology. Mm. If Melania wants a divorce from Donald Trump, Donald Trump might think that Melania has stolen Donald Trump's technology, right? <laughs> I mean, so, so uh, because he is from Slovenia, you know, so it's a foreign joint venture. And uh, the same, same story, Saik and General Motors. So Saik wanted a divorce. Saik is a Shanghai Automotive Industry Corporation from China. It's a, Shang it's a Chinese public sector enterprise. And they were making car together in China like an EPT joint venture. And Saik uh, asked... Uh, uh, General Motors, as, as I informed them that uh, we are no longer interested in this uh, joint venture. We, we need a breakup. So GM was not keen. Why GM was not keen? Because GM thought this is not going to benefit GM. A breakup will not result into benefit for GM. GM was making a lot of uh, uh, revenue from uh, Chinese business uh, by way of uh, joint venture business with the uh, SAIC in China. So, so such, sometimes it can be a challenge, you know. Yeah. Yeah, any comments or any questions? I Professor, I have a question. Okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to add that on the example that any uh, mentioned that could, could also be like a promotion strategy for from both companies. For example, Uber joined Walgreens recently to give free trips to to patients who are gonna receive the COVID vaccine at Walgreens location. So not necessarily it's a equity joint venture, but most likely like a promotion strategy that will benefit both companies at the end. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's simply a marketing strategy. I mean, you can call it as an alliance. It's an alliance. It's an example for an alliance. Alliances it can, be called, okay. it can be called a strategic alliance, but it's a marketing strategy, of course. Uh, I, mean, it, 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 I mean, in case uh, if Uber is going to spend their money uh, it, it, is a, it can be called a CSR strategy, Corporate Social Responsibility Strategy. So in case you Uber is going to invest money and providing voluntary free service to the people, those who are going to Walgreens, in case if Uber is going to do that, you said Walgreens, right? Yeah, Walgreens. Okay, so they, they are doing that for all the seniors or for the public also? Uh, for the public who's gonna go to Walgreens to receive vaccines, they're giving free trips. Okay, so for everybody in in uh, in San Juan or all U.S. I didn't know about it. They this is mainly this is mainly in U.S. and they possibly have like a limited amount of of trips, but they are doing like the promotion with Walgreens, so to incent incentivate people to go to have ever seen on certain Walgreens. Yeah, I mean, the Walgreens would have promoted that. Well, the, the Walgreens have signed a memorandum of understanding with them. So that is the reason they do it. They have an MOU, they have an alliance with Uber, Uber and Walgreens Alliance. So yeah, that's a, that's that's not an equity joint budget, but it's an alliance. It's a, it's a, it's a marketing strategic alliance. Professor, my question would be if, for example, the the you know Sprint and T-Mobile and Puerto Rico got together. Would you call that a joint venture? Which one, T-Mobile and Sprint and T-Mobile? Sprint and T-Mobile. T-Mobile sells uh, uh, mobile phone and uh, Trent. Uh, what what kind of business they have? 
I mean, both of them together. What is the business they do together? Yeah, um, actually, they got together as in for the red, like for the 4G. The, they offering the same uh, um, service. So I think maybe that could be a joint venture because um, all the clients of Sprint now has have the same services as the T-Mobile offers. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, for example, simple, simple alliance in telephonic industry, for example, iPhone and AT&T, they operate together. Uh, iPhone and T-Mobile, they operate together. For example, if you, if you want to go to buy an iPhone and you go to Apple Store and Apple Store will give you a phone connection. So it might be T-Mobile or you can choose uh, AT&T or T-Mobile or any other uh, phone line. So it's, it's, it's because they have, a, they have an alliance. They have a, they have a memorandum of understanding. So there, there are simple forms of alliances. Strategic alliance or an alliance uh, in business is a very broadly defined terminology, a very broadly defined, uh, uh, it's a very broad set of terminology for all sorts of collaborations between two different companies. Yes, and in the T-Mobile Sprint case, T-Mobile actually successfully acquired Sprint last year. They, they actually had a merger. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we move on to the next mode of uh, next strategy, turnkey project. Turnkey, this is mainly in infrastructure sector or construction industries. Here, contractor agrees to handle every detail of project for a foreign client. Sometimes, you know, some foreign markets, you know, like every country is created with different kind of resources and, and uh, it is like, uh, you know, some countries are cash rich, but they don't have uh, all other facilities, you know, capital intensive countries, they don't have agricultural products sometimes. And when you have very, very, when you're very good in agricultural sector, you don't have enough capital. So each and every country has its own problems. Like you know, each one of us, we are, we, are, we are also born and we are also grown up with uh, some strength and some weaknesses. We don't have every good thing in our life. You know, so we, we have uh, somebody, you know, who has uh, money will not have something, uh, maybe somebody who is healthy may not be wealthy, somebody who is wealthy may not be healthy. The same way countries are also created that way. So that is why the need for international trade arises. And in, in some countries, there are no good construction companies. So in that case, they hire, they always hire foreign companies for construction activities. So many countries do that, like Middle Eastern countries, like the Gulf countries, Arab countries, many of them, they don't have very good construction companies. They always hire uh, construction companies from foreign countries. African countries, they don't have excellent construction companies. They hire construction companies from other countries. So uh, even in some South American countries, some of them don't have an excellent uh, construction company. So they, they, they always hire foreign companies for construction activities. So in such cases, contractor agrees to handle every detail of project for a foreign client. And advert, this is a turnkey project, means, you know, it's a, simple, it's a simple contract that I will sign an agreement that I will do so-and-so construction, so-and-so infrastructure building or construction within three years or within two years, subject to so-and-so conditions. And I will agree to handle every detail of the project for a foreign client, and I will also hand over the keys on expiry of the contract. Advantage is that can earn a return on knowledge assets. And is less risky than conventional FDI. Disadvantage, no long-term interest in the foreign country. It may create a competitor. Selling process technology and competitive advantage as well. Quick question, um, the turnkey projects, uh, how could it, and if you could provide an example, how could it create a competitor? Yeah, so this, uh, you're talking about disadvantages? Yes. 
uh, because uh, you know uh, sometimes companies uh, they don't go to foreign markets with uh, all the employees from their own country they have some kind of co cooperation agreement some kind of uh, arrangement in a foreign market uh, to hire laborers and then some labor or supplier company uh, will learn uh, how this company is doing it and and the, the method of doing business once you know once you learn how you're doing how this company is doing this business so, so you know then automatically you might think about uh, setting up your own company so that is how sometimes uh, it can be to uh, competition i mean some so local local because you cannot do everything in a foreign country by way of uh, uh sending your own employees from foreign country to a local country so you always need some local help and local partner to do certain activities and uh, when you have when you have that kind of collaboration with the uh, local partners to do certain activities uh, they will learn how you do things or you have to teach them how you do things and then once they learn they might set up their own company so that's a risk or that's a, that you know so it might create competitor that way yeah Okay, thank you. Yeah, so foreign subsidiary, we move on to foreign subsidiary or foreign branch or foreign subsidiary. So if your purpose is just sales, you can simply set up a foreign branch, foreign sales office. So, so yeah, you may you know, suppose in, in some industries, your purpose is just to sell in foreign uh, market and and uh, or in services sector banking sector insurance sector your goal is just to sell so you you open some sales offices and uh, use the sales office as your channel and uh, yeah foreign subsidiary foreign subsidiary is mainly the word subsidiary is used when you are setting up a production facility in a foreign market This can be done either through investment or acquisitions in the foreign country. Advantages, no risk of losing technical competence to a competitor, tight control of operations, disadvantage, bare full cost and risk. Yeah, so here you can see foreign subsidiary either through investment or acquisitions in the foreign country. So investment means your own investment. And you set up your own foreign subsidiary, it can be for manufacturing activity. For example, I tell you, Toyota from Japan, they have a big factory in Kentucky. So they invested their money from Japan to set up their first factory in America in Kentucky state of the US. So this is an example for classic example for foreign subsidiary, Japanese foreign subsidiary of Toyota company in Kentucky. And they make uh, Toyota cars in Kentucky and sell in the US. So they, they, they entered into the US market to set up their subsidiary by way of setting up their factory in Kentucky with the intention to sell in the US market in a big way rather than exporting cars from Japan or some other country where they have a production unit. So when you have long term interest to sell in a foreign market, you think about producing in that foreign market by setting up your own subsidiary. And this can be done either through your own foreign direct investment, which is uh, nothing but your own money coming from foreign country. Otherwise, you can buy a local company. When you buy a local company, it is called as acquisition. So setting up a foreign subsidiary has advantages and disadvantages. Advantages include no risk of losing technical competence to a competitor. Tight control of operations. Disadvantage, you have to bear full cost and risk. It's a disadvantage because you have to invest a lot of money. Uh, 
acquisition or greenfield acquisition or greenfield uh, like acquisition uh, normally companies think about acquisition when they monitor and do market research and learn that competitors are interested into the same market entry where well, let's say your company is interested in some particular foreign market you also learn that competitors are also eyeing on capturing market share in that market when you see that competitors are doing that you don't want to wait so you decide to enter into foreign markets and you know so uh, you think about acquisition instead of greenfield investment because greenfield investment will take time you need not only money to do the greenfield investment but also it is you know setting up everything from scratch so greenfield investment is a time consuming process it is a organic process acquisition is an inorganic process and you buy an existing uh, company or you buy an existing uh, project that is what is acquisition so acquisition can be done overnight or acquisition can be done uh, within a month or within a week but uh, greenfield investment will take time because greenfield investment is organic you know you know difference between organic growth and inorganic growth right mm -hmm. yeah between what professor i do not understand what difference did, between say it again what did you not understanding you said difference between acquisition and greenfield investment okay got it acquisition is an example for inorganic growth and greenfield investment in a foreign country is an example for organic marketing strategy or organic growth strategy because or greenfield investment means you set up everything from zero everything from scratch you buy land you build a property you know everything you have to do uh, to set up your business facility when you do greenfield investments it is like giving birth to a child and raising a child it will take time right and it, it will take 10 years to to raise a child but uh, if you are adopting a child that you can do it overnight so acquisition is like ad ad adopting adopting a child and uh, greenfield investment is like uh, giving birth to a child and raising the child so greenfield investment is organic and acquisition is inorganic yeah so regardless of any of this entry modes regardless of any of this foreign market entry modes experts and consultants always advise because certain things when you select a business partners because you have to select business partners it can be franchising it can be licensing it can be joint venture it can be symbol alliance for any sort of business market entry method any for any sort of entry you need to have a partner partner will be in different different type of partners and different uh, uh, you know uh, type of companies are available for partnership so business is based on interdependence business is based on partnership regardless of any of this mode so you need you have a partner to do your business and 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 your partner selection need to be done scientifically and strategically and diplomatically i repeat scientifically strategically and diplomatically for example if you have a consultant and uh, you seek consultant's opinion consultants will always advise that get as much information as possible on the potential partner this is what uh, 
consultant uh, advice you know so always uh, uh, consultant advice this when when uh, you are looking for a business partner and collect data collect data from informed third parties it can be former partners of the same company it can be investment bankers it can be former employees so in other words you can also say that you can also look for you can also get a credit report of this potential partner credit report also helps to understand uh whether this potential partner is sincere in in his uh, uh, past dealings and track record of the partner and such kind of things that helps otherwise uh, sometimes uh, it is uh, it it is a problem otherwise you know yeah so it can be a challenge otherwise and get to know the potential partner before committing so these are some advices uh, for uh, strategic uh, selection of the partners uh, in business otherwise uh, sometimes if you don't do this sometimes uh, uh, you might uh, uh, get into problems or you might get into challenge sometimes it happens you know yeah so sometimes uh, some of these companies their business uh, owners local partners they might have criminal background you never know in case if you don't get the uh, background report it can happen in real life it can happen in business it can happen in any sector so i i've seen a couple of examples in business and i have seen a couple of example in 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 life also so uh, yeah, you know sometimes uh, selecting a partner needs to be done very very carefully otherwise uh, sometimes we all end up in uh, some kind of uh, problems and challenges and uh, so that is why this is all need to be done very 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 carefully the other day I was watching a, a documentary in uh, cbs news yeah uh, yeah no it was nbc yeah nbc yeah it was it was telecast in cbs news but it was it was a lady from nbc yeah so the story was that uh, there were two stories they were talking about one was that uh, uh somebody who was released from jail after two years of imprisonment and then he was dating a girl and he never told this girl that he came from jail <laughs> and uh, <laughs> girl fell in love with him and then he promised her to marry her. <laughs> Uh, finally girl got into trouble and then uh, girl got into relationship with him and then uh, she didn't know all this kind of things and this, this can happen i mean this kind of stories are there everywhere and uh, uh, another story was uh, uh, yeah this was the nbc's anchor it was her own story which is uh, released in uh, cnbc that, her, that lady's name is benita alexander now she has a website where she has the story also and she uh, she met with a very successful doctor medical doctor who was a surgeon very famous surgeon and uh, he she says this gentleman lied about everything to her and uh, uh, they decided to get married and then she found that uh, he has two children after they decide to get married and all those kind of things so <laughs> a lot of stories interesting stories <laughs> so yeah so i mean in business also you you lot, lot of businesses fail if your potential business partner has some uh issues because if you if your business partner can uh you know can actually uh, help you to succeed business partner also will create problem for you in case if you have a wrong business partner so it's very important to select your business partner very carefully with the background check with uh, those kind of things yeah so otherwise uh, you might run into problem outsourcing outsourcing uh videos and you know so there are a couple of videos also on outsourcing and depending upon the time we can see that otherwise i think this class may not have enough time for outsourcing video but uh, uh outsourcing is another entry strategy many companies do outsourcing these days to reduce the cost for example business process outsourcing and knowledge process outsourcing and uh, 
uh, business process outsourcing, classic example is a call center. Many, many companies, suppose if you make a telephone call, plus H1 number, uh, the US number, sometimes calls are picked up by people sitting in Philippines or India and those kind of countries because call centers are outsourced to those kind of countries. My own example, I, I called, made a couple of calls to Microsoft. Last month, I made a call to Microsoft plus one number. So, and, and call was picked up by someone in Philippines. Microsoft has a call center, big call center in Philippines. And uh, Yahoo, when I designed my website, drjustinpaul.com, so I was looking at uh, uh, a company to host my website. So I, I made a call to Yahoo and uh, plus one number, and, and it was picked up by Sangeeta from India. And she said, my name is Sangeeta. So, uh, that's also a call center. So a lot of, lot of call centers that way. These are all examples for uh, global outsourcing. So yeah, so if you have any experience you can share, then we can move on. Yeah, I have an example. Um, uh, actually where I work, there's a company that does the publishing and the uh, Facebooks and and they have their own company here in Puerto Rico, but they outsource their customer service to Republica Dominicana. So that's probably the closest example I've I've experienced. Yes, yes. There are several examples that uh, a lot of uh, proofreading activities are done uh, in countries like India and Philippines for European and American publishing companies these days because they send the files by email and then so a lot of things are, you know, so those are all uh, examples. And I have a numerical problem for you to solve. It's a very, very simple problem. Maybe you can uh, read this. Somebody can read this and others can, others can solve this. Uh, assume that the McDonald's USA has a scheme to offer foreign franchisee subjects to 20% of profit from a franchisee as royalty every quarter. Foreign franchisee owner has to invest the money to be spent as fixed cost and variable cost. The total variable cost, total operating expenses, incurred as operating cost for the first quarter of 2009 by Dubai franchisee is $5,000 US. And the total revenue is $6,000 US. Compute the royalty to be paid to McDonald's USA by Dubai franchisee. So how do you calculate this? This is a quarterly statistics. Would it be the the twenty percent from the the net income or the net revenue? I should say, it's like twenty percent of a thousand. Yes. Okay. Total revenue, total revenue minus total uh, cost uh, six thousand minus five thousand. So that means okay. uh, profit is one thousand. Okay. So, and McDonald's uh, has franchise agreement with 20% of profit sharing in this case. If they have a 20% of profit sharing in this case, uh, McDonald's US will get 20% uh, of $1,000. That will be $100. Yeah, that will mm -hmm. be $100. Yeah, so because what happens really is that when a company is franchising, you cannot really ask for 70% of profit or 80% of profit because uh, your local partner is investing money. So if you ask for 70% of profit uh, to be shared with the parent company, sometimes the local partners are not interested to do business with you. Okay. 
in the end, oh. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, uh, you know, so you have to be kind with the local partners when you do the franchisee business. Otherwise, they would say that I don't want to invest my money when you're, if you're asking for 70% of profit to you. Mm -hmm. So normally in franchising, almost every company, the parent company, they only ask for less than 50% of the profit. Many cases, 20, 25, 30, 35, sometimes 15. So uh, that is the average profit sharing in franchising. Yeah, so it's uh, 7.25 now. Okay, so what I will do is that I do have a video on Subway, Subway's international expansion. Maybe I can play that video so that uh, break time, those who don't need break, you can uh, uh, think about uh, some point to discuss about Subway, Subway's international expansion, and those who want to take break, you can take break, uh, but it is, I think it makes sense to play the video now. And uh, yeah, and, and, and then we will have more opportunity and time for discussing the video after the break. Yeah, so what do you prefer after watching this video? Would you like to simply discuss or would you like to make uh, statements like last time we did two statements or three statements? What do you prefer? I think it's better to discuss with Alex and yeah, General discussion. General discussion, that's what you prefer, or do you like to make a true statement and false statement? General discussion. Also. Discussion. Yeah, general. Okay, so if you prefer general discussion, general discussion, we can do it today. So we can have different methodology. Uh, you know, so you have to judge uh, what Subway is uh, doing and you have to judge uh, whether the decision taken by Subway is appropriate and uh, correct. And you have to also say that, uh, you have to also come with your recommendation after watching the video, what uh, you will do for Subway in case if Subway hires you to do further expansion into foreign markets. All right. We have to discuss, discussion should go in that direction. By the early 1980s, Subway had several hundred franchises across the United States, but it was looking to expand even further. Franchising internationally meant that millions more potential customers could be reached. We thought to ourselves, you know, we ought to grow outside the U.S., but we had no idea of what to do. I'll never forget when I went to uh, England with Fred for the first trade show. We went over there because they spoke English. They weren't too interested. We didn't really come back with any results. Went, went to their second year, and somebody said that they wanted to open a store in Bahrain, in the Persian Gulf. And we just said, okay. And that was actually our first international store in Bahrain. Uh, a few years later, we thought, let's open a store in Canada. Being Canadians, we're, you know, very close to the American border. And the first time we actually ever saw Subway was traveling somewhere in the States. But when we went back to Canada, Winnipeg in Canada, we found out that the first one had actually opened in our city. So we made time at that point to find out who the development agent was, made an appointment to see him, and the rest is kind of history. The Spears happily opened one Canadian franchise, then two. But for Subway, things on the international front were still touch and go. 
in the beginning, it was simply opening where people suggested that we open. And we wound up with uh, low density of stores in many countries around the world and a team of field people really flying from place to place to help folks. It was highly inefficient, uh, but it gave us a good foundation to get started. Subway soldiered on, and as relationships with franchisees grew, so did the opportunities for international expansion. We had to apply to Fred to go and develop stores in the UK. The beauty of all this was that we were on a, well, let's see if it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. We've already got two stores. We opened in Brighton, right on the South Coast. As soon as that logo went up, because it's all about the recognition of the brand, that as soon as the store opened up between Americans, Canadians, Australians, and even the Japanese, they, they almost flocked to the store. You could see them running down the street. Yeah, we actually Subway. saw people running. Because this was the first Subway store in the UK. So that was exciting. Then selling it to the actual British that weren't familiar with the brand, that took a lot, a little bit of work. Behind the scenes, Subway was riding a sharp learning curve as their storefronts continued to fill the map. Singaporeans are very into their food, and I knew that they would be accepting of a, a good product. As long as it was a good product, um, it, would, it would go over well. Um, except that the challenge was bread. People don't eat sandwiches in Singapore uh, then very much. And so trying to get people to eat sandwiches was a, a real challenge. The region I cover goes from Pakistan, where you have different languages, Turkey has a different language. Um, the Middle East goes with the Arabic language. And the African continent even goes with different languages. So South Africa, first language is English. And then you go to other countries where English is not really the first language. So wide diversity of cultures and religions and languages. And that's really interesting to work with. The countries you deal with are well-developed and wealthy, such as the Cayman Islands, all the way to the extremely poor, such as Nicaragua or Bolivia. Um, each have their own different characteristics. A lot of people make mistakes of thinking Latin America, well, they all speak Spanish or Portuguese and it's all just one area. And actually each country is very distinct. A team of experts had to be employed to better understand the logistics of each country. The way that the organization is structured is we have divided the world into various regions and we have regional directors who would be the leaders of their regions and we may have some sub-regions under them. We had to develop a team of people that could run stores plus we had to get a team of customers. Now once you start crossing borders difficulty magnifies. Not only do you have nobody who knows what they're doing and no customers, you have different laws, different culture, different supply lines. Subway needed a strategic plan. We realized after we spent all the time and expense, legal fees, etc., to go into these countries, we'd show up and say, oh, gee, we have a potential for maybe five stores. That was a lot of expense for only five stores. There's been um, certainly a lot of either customs or religious law or cultural uh, forays that require us to adapt. So you take a look at India, for example, they're primarily vegetarian and certainly no beef would be on the menu. Um, and the same thing goes for the Middle East countries, the Muslim countries where you wouldn't have pork on the menu. For Subway, one of the keys to their international success was to adapt to each culture, but keep the basic product the same. There are a lot of local flavors. Some want a bit of a spicier flavor. Um, so we have spicier sauces or cheeses or mixes. A very famous product in Australia, which was developed, it's called the Aussie Chicken Filler. And it is very much a local product. It's a very flavoursome chicken product, and it's one of our top sellers. We had sandwiches with uh, shrimps, we had with salmon, and uh, as we see from for all the stores, the shrimps and salmon last summer, but when we launched it, it was very high, high we had high sales for this, and people like it. The paneer chico with the mint sauce is fantastic, and they have um, like potato 
sandwich. It's, 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 it's a bit, sounds a bit odd, but it tastes good. Pakistan, where they like spicy sandwiches and especially chicken. So we have a sandwich called chicken tikka. South Africa, on the other hand, they have like one of those great local sandwiches called chicken mayo. So we have literally chicken mixed with a lot of mayonnaise put in a sandwich. People think, might think that in Israel we should have uh, the restaurant or think the restaurant are kosher. But the, most of the restaurants in Israel are regular food, same as Subway all over the world, non-kosher with cheese. Uh, we don't have pork in Israel. Subway sandwiches are now known and loved in several thousand locations worldwide. As with any success story, there were a lot of valuable lessons learned along the way. When we first started developing internationally, we were a business of English only which obviously is going to impede your ability to um, develop quickly. Uh, we have since started to develop training centers, and uh, we do have training centers all around the world. And um, it's through emails, uh, live conferences, um, conference calls, you name it. Um, that's how we are reaching our franchisees in you know, extreme locations as far as uh, you know, the uh, extreme south of Argentina, the end of our, t uh, of our uh, region here. But uh, uh, technology is definitely the way that we are able to get that information out there um, in as fast as we can. A lot of it is, is people and, and finding the right people and then providing the right support on the local level um, through the staff that we hire, through the development agents that we recruit. Um, they're really both the leaders in their respective areas and countries. With the aid of one of our consultants, we built a proprietary software. We'll look at a country and we'll look at the GDP, we'll look at the business climate, we'll look at the uh, franchise development, fast food development, anything in the uh, uh, overall business opportunity sector and say, yeah, that's worth going. We can open a lot of stores there or no, it's a developing country. Let's wait a little while. And so we're very resourceful. And it's keeping calm, always being flexible, always having a plan B or plan C, being ready and being proactive to help prevent things from happening. And, and this is the way in developing countries, you really have to work and be flexible and adaptable. If you look at um, the opportunity and the population of the planet, and the number of restaurants that we have, we've got nowhere to go but up. We're only at the tip of the iceberg.